pleasure to welcome you to the first of what is a two-part program, Listen Up, Climate Stories and Philadelphia Youth. It's offered, as you know, during our university's Climate Week, and Listen Up is part of a multi-year public research project of the program in environmental humanities, and that project is called My Climate Story. Tonight and tomorrow, we have the privilege to hear from and then talk with one of today's most astute climate storytellers and a gifted climate listener, Debbie Lockwood. I'll introduce Debbie more formally in just a moment, but first I wanna tell you just a little bit about the My Climate Story Project and also let you know how you can get involved. Before I do that, though, I'd like to say thanks to the various people and programs who have made this ambitious, extraordinary program possible. So many thanks to the Penn English Department, the Program in Comparative Literature, the Andrea Mitchell Center for Democracy, Penn Sustainability, and the Environmental Innovations Initiative. Huge thanks to the Kelly Writers House for so generously hosting and organizing tonight's event and for providing the reception which I'm very much looking forward to. <laughs> and a special shout out to our talented team at PPH, our amazing student interns, and especially to our program coordinators, Angela Ferranda and Mia Devanza, who you see here. Now, let me tell you just a little bit about my climate story. So I'm from the state of Maine, and in 2019, I was walking around in the summer along the shoreline of our family property. Trees that had been healthy the year before were gray and dying. They had become rampikes, dead trees, felled by saltwater intrusion, more obvious sentinels of rising seawater than the salt marsh that is also going underwater. A few months earlier, I had taught a class for Philadelphia high school teachers, a course on the environmental humanities and place-based education that focused on the Schuylkill River. Halfway through that class, one teacher, Bobby Stewart, remarked, climate change is in the background of everything we're learning in this class. It should be in the foreground. I thought about Bobby's insight all summer, and I thought about other teachers' comments that they would like to introduce climate change into their classrooms, but that they didn't feel equipped to do so. I considered the rampikes and the dying marsh in front of me, and I considered how vulnerable that made me feel. Previously, I had rather naively thought of climate change as happening primarily somewhere else, to other people, in the Arctic, for example, or the Gulf Coast, or in small island states. Climate change was sad, to be sure, but I experienced, I had been experiencing that sadness at some remove. It wasn't really about me in a concrete, life-changing kind of way. Seeing the dying trees on my family's property was the first time I really took climate change personally. It felt like a terrible blow to our family's history in a place we love so well, and a blow to our future hopes, too. Out of this climate grief, I began to consider if it might be possible to develop tools to teach others how to recognize climate change, even if we're not on the front lines. On a globally changing planet, we all, after all, have climate stories of a great variety. Some, like my own, are stories of considerable climate privilege. The next spring and summer I worked, mostly remotely, it was pandemic, with an extraordinary group of Penn students who encouraged me to bring the storytelling tools we'd been developing to workshops. The next year we offered two dozen workshops and we made a 12-minute documentary about our work also featuring some high school teachers who had participated in one or more of our online workshops. We also wrote a climate storytelling workbook, which we're very proud of, and working with coordinator and archivist Mia Devanza, we've also been growing a story bank. Do you need to take Okay, <laughs> we've been growing a story bank, a collection of climate stories tagged up with light metadata, and these stories function as companions to the big quantita quantitative metrics of data banks that are more often used to represent climate change. As my students often say, our short vignettes make, I'm quoting Evie here, the vastness of climate change meaningful on a human scale. 
this school year with another fantastic group of Penn student interns at the program in environmental humanities. We're working directly and now in person too with nine high school teachers with support from Making a Difference with a Making a Difference grant from the School of Arts and Sciences and Chris Sikich uh, is here with us today. You can see Chris uh, also here. <laughs> um, together, we're using this pilot curriculum and working together to co-create and share more climate curriculum resources with teachers who want to introduce climate into their classroom but don't necessarily feel equipped to do so. Teachers and students' work is being published in monthly installments on the project website. And you see the nine teachers here. And in a minute, I'll show you um, the first uh, installments of, of what we're seeing going on in these climate classrooms. And I'm going to show you um, the example by teacher Matt Scanlon of Northeast High School. So all year long, all of these students will be working to, um, well, let me, let me actually show you Matt's work. Here's Matt's work. Um, each month, each teacher is supplying us with three digital artifacts. You can see here, Matt uh, submitted a climate drawing, a climate change pictograph, and a climate change article. And he supplies lesson plans and descriptions of these. Here you see the students completed work. I particularly loved this one uh, in response to listening to uh, a TED talk by uh, science communicator Catherine Hayhoe. One student's takeaway was, we don't have to be a liberal tree hugger to care about climate change. And the tree hugger illustration is just beautiful. <laughs> it really makes me chuckle. So all this year long, our students will be working to research, document, and share Philadelphians' climate stories. And these will be presented at a festival at the end of April, shared together with policy recommendations to Philadelphia City Council and the mayor's office, and then made into a book together with some of the curricular materials that the teachers and, of course, the students are creating. Tomorrow, also here on Penn's campus, the several hundred students and their teachers will all meet one another for the first time. Chris was just telling me that his students aren't allowed to have their phones with them. Other students will be. It's going to be quite a day. They will be treated to interactive activities with tonight's speaker, Debbie. And they'll also participate in writing workshops designed especially for them by the award-winning Cosmic Writers. And uh, Cosmic's executive director, Rowanna Miller, is here with us tonight. It's just a fantastic program born right here in the Kelly Writers House. And we're so excited to see what they'll do together. The highlight of tomorrow's event for students, however, will no doubt be their morning interactive session with tonight's guest, Debbie Lockwood. And of course, you are all invited to that session tomorrow as well. When I first began dreaming up Listen Up and considering who I wanted to invite, Debbie was at the very top of my wish list. And in one of those cosmic coincidences, as I had my laptop out to write to Debbie, she happened to write to me on a matter for the Philadelphia Inquirer. I was in Germany, and I had zero idea that Debbie had just joined our Fair City's paper of record. I was thrilled and excited, and the collaboration on Listen Up seemed to me at least foreordained. So what a pleasure it is to introduce you to Debbie, this person who I knew as author of 1001 Voices on Climate Change, Oh, I forgot to tell you, this is how you can contribute your climate story. So please do, do that, check it out. Um, and Cosmic is here, uh, fantastic program. And here's Debbie's book, and please uh, also buy the book. Um, so I, um, let me just say, this latter-day Scheherazade is now also the commentary and ideas editor at The Inquirer. The book came out last year with Simon & Schuster, and as I think we will hear, it's based on years traveling and researching in 20 countries on six continents. Devi has been a National Geographic explorer. She's a graduate of MIT science writing program, and before that, went to college at that other school in Boston. Devi graduated from Harvard Phi Beta Kappa and Summa Cum Laude with a degree in folklore and mythology and a language citation in Arabic. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, and frankly, too many other venues to name here. So now, with no further ado, please join me in welcoming Debbie Lockwood. Thank you. 
Okay, wow, that was quite the introduction, and it's such an honor to be here, truly, um, with you all in this beautiful space and to be a part of the storytelling event. So thank you to me and Bethany for making this happen and to all the teachers and students who I'm really excited to meet tomorrow and all of you here tonight. So I'm going to share a bit of the backstory of how I got started on this wild harebrained adventure and then read a little bit and then I would love to open up to questions because I think that's the most fun part is hearing what you guys are curious about and we can dive into any number of rabbit holes from there but um, I guess to get started so in 2013 I was living in Boston during the marathon bombing and for those of you guys who might not remember that there were several bombs that went off near the finish line that killed and injured many runners and spectators the whole city was on lockdown while they did a manhunt for the people who were responsible um, and of course you know being on lockdown for a couple of days doesn't seem like such a big deal in COVID times but at the time it was a, a pretty intense event to go through as a person living in the city and once it was possible to go back outside again and when the lockdown was lifted i realized that all i wanted to do was just have face-to-face -face conversations with strangers and remind myself that not everyone is murderous so uh, i was living in a cooperative house at the time we had our vegetables delivered in bulk so there was a lot of cardboard lying around so i cut open a cardboard box and made that sign that you can see at the top there uh, that said open call for stories and found a piece of ribbon and hung it around my neck. Um, I also happened to have a bunch of balloons with me because I thought people might need to see me better <laughs> um, and just walked around the city with this sign on my neck. And um, people stared at me. I think they thought it was pretty weird, um, but some approached me to share their story. And once I started listening to strangers in this way, I realized I didn't really want to stop. It was one of those rare moments where I felt really aligned and like I was doing what I was supposed to be doing for whatever reason. Um, so that summer I went on a bike trip and this bike trip was about 800 miles down the Mississippi River. So I started in Memphis, Tennessee and ended in Venice, Louisiana where the river meets the Gulf of Mexico. And my undergraduate major was in folklore mythology. So I wanted to listen to any kind of stories people had to share with me. No theme, just me, the bicycle, the sign, and a question. Tell me a story about whatever you want to tell them about. <laughs> and um, the farther down the river I was riding the bike, though, the more stories I was hearing specifically about water and climate change. It felt like everyone had a water or climate change story to share. And those had to do with things like intensifying storms, saltwater encroachment on the land, and in some cases, people making a really difficult decision to leave a place that they had called home for generations in the aftermath of a big storm. And I could see the rubble of some destroyed homes that have just been left there for years. And I remember meeting this one woman. I think you know many of us who do climate storytelling have these stories that stick in our minds, right? Um, and her name's Franny. She was 57 year old, years old at the time and lived about 80 miles south of New Orleans. And I stopped in front of her office one afternoon on the bike and she invited me to get in outside from the afternoon sun and she shared her lunch with me, which was really kind. And in between bites, she told me about Hurricane Isaac in 2012, which had washed away her home, her neighborhood. She said, we fight for the protection of our levees. We fight for our marsh every time we have a hurricane. But despite that, she and her husband moved back to their plot of land in a mobile home just a few months after the storm. I couldn't imagine living anywhere else, she said. Do you think there will come a time when people can't live here anymore? I asked her. I think so. Not in my lifetime, but you'll probably see it. So as I was on my bike, I started to imagine the road that I was on underwater, and that was pretty chilly. 20 miles ahead, I could see where the ocean lapped over the road some days at high tide, and there was this big sign that just said water on road. And locals jokingly refer to that endpoint as the end of the world. So I wondered what it might mean to put Franny's story in dialogue with stories from all over the world. And my goal became to listen to stories about water and climate change, amplify the voices of those most impacted, and over the course of about five years, I documented 1,001 stories from people who are living with the impacts of climate change in 20 countries on five continents. And I revised the sign to be more specific because some people asked me if I was selling telephones when it just said open call for stories, which I was not. Um, so specificity is important. <laughs> um, 
So, and I also set out to address another problem because the language that we use to discuss climate change is often really abstract and inaccessible. We hear about things like feet of sea level rise or degrees of temperature change or even parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But what does that really mean for people's everyday lives? So one of the first stops on my journey was Tuvalu. This is a very small coral island nation in the South Pacific that is on track to become uninhabitable due to both food and water insecurity in our lifetime. The country is about 585 miles south of the equator, home to around 10,000 people, and the highest point is only about 13 feet above sea level. Um, this is what you might see as you're approaching from the air. Um, there used to be a freshwater lens on the island so that people could dig a shallow well and have water to drink. But in the last 20 years, that water has become both salty and contaminated from sea level rise. And people first started to notice that something was wrong because taro and pulaka crops, which are two starchy staples of Tuvaluan cuisine, were rotting. So a lot has changed in Tuvalu in the last couple of decades. Thatched roofs and freshwater wells are a thing of the past. Those wells are repurposed as trash heaps. And all the water for washing, cooking, and drinking now comes from the rain. Each home has a water tank attached to the roof by a gutter. And during periods of drought in Tuvalu, families have to make really tough decisions about how to allocate water, which is precious. So Angelina, who's closest to me here, um, is a mother of three. And she told me that during a recent drought, her middle daughter was only a few months old. She, her husband, and oldest daughter could all swim in the sea to wash themselves, but what about her baby? The newborn skin was just too delicate. If she went into the salt water, she would get a really horrible rash. How can a mother decide between having water to drink and water to bathe her child? The, the stories I heard about water and climate change in Tuvalu had a really sharp generation, or excuse me, a sharp division across generational lines. Tuvaluans my age, like Angelina, don't really see their future on the islands and are applying for visas to live in New Zealand. Older Tuvaluans see climate change as an act of God and told me that they couldn't imagine living anywhere else because they didn't want to leave the bones of their ancestors, which were buried in the front yard. So climate change, as I'm sure many of you know, is an environmental justice issue. Typically, people who are most impacted by the problem are also those who have contributed to it the least. And any solutions that don't prioritize the voices of people who are living with the impacts of climate change right now, the majority of whom are women, people of color, and those living in the global south, will just perpetuate the systemic inequality that brought us to this point of climate crisis in the first place. But one thing I really believe is that storytelling can be an intervention into climate silence, an invitation to use this ancient human technology of connecting through language and narrative to counteract inaction. And it's a way to get those voices into powerful rooms. Um, so I'm gonna read a little bit, if that's okay with you guys. <laughs> um, and it's a little section from the introduction about listening. I guess it's kind of my like ethos for this whole thing or a distillation of what I learned <laughs> about listening by doing these 1001 interviews that I hope might be of use to someone so they don't have to go through exactly what I got through to get to the end point. <laughs> but um, throughout the journey, I developed a method of deep listening. This was hard earned and not at all instinctual. When I listened to early clips of my journey down the Mississippi, I cringe. I was just too pushy. I spoke over storytellers, eager to insert myself. I listened only halfway, the other half of my mind on how I might respond or redirect the conversation. I'm an auditory person. When I meet someone, the first thing I notice is the musicality of their voice, how they let the taste of a word linger on their tongue or send sentences flying into the ether. Breath, intonation, word choice. Sometimes my favorite thing to do is just close my eyes and listen. In Margaret Wheatley's 2001 article, Listening as Healing, written a few days after 9-11, she wrote, great healing is available when we listen to each other. No matter what we have experienced in life, if we can tell our story to someone who listens, we find it easier to deal with our circumstances. Listening is such a simple act, she continues. It requires us to be present, 
and that takes practice, but we don't have to do anything else. We don't have to advise or coach or sound wise. We just have to be willing to sit there and listen, and if we do that, we create moments in which real healing is available. So when I'm listening, microphone in hand, nodding along, and not breaking eye contact, there have been so many times when people have said, thank you, thank you for listening, or it feels so good to share this story with you because I've never shared it with anyone else before. In listening, I wanna be sure that people feel respected and heard. I met a Belgian woman in the UK who told me the story of how her hometown's water supply was contaminated from a plant that put a waterproof treatment on fabric. A man from Afghanistan lost his brother because of water contamination. An American woman visited the Florida Keys as a teenager, only to return years later and find that the reef was dead, bleached. Thank you for listening, each of them told me. I enjoy listening to people whose perspectives and takes on the world are different from my own. There's a difference between offering stories and opinion and offering something aggressive or vitriolic. The first comes from the desire to share and connect. The second is purely an attack. One carries the potential for change and exchange, the other does not. Deep listening then has to start from the basic premise that we are all equal, all worthy of being listened to, all human, that everyone has a story to share, that those stories matter, and that we can learn from each other if only we are fully present. Deep listening is listening without the intention to respond listening with the whole of one's body, making eye contact, leaning forward, nodding along without interrupting. Deep listening is honoring, is bearing witness, is keeping one's ears and mind open without the distraction of ego or fear. That kind of listening is urgently needed in the climate crisis because listening is the first stop on the way to solution building. And if we're building solutions that don't take into account the voices of people who will be impacted, it's dangerous and more importantly, ineffective. Um, so that's kind of the piece I wanted to read. Um, I have other sections that I could read, but I figure it might be fun to do some questions first, if that sounds good questions. to you guys. And then we can, if you want, we can yeah. Some yeah, yeah, I love that. Um, ask me anything. <laughs> Oh, we've got a mic. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the the structures in the systems that are have, have grown up over a couple mm -hmm. of centuries and have um, caused a lot of the problems and divided the world in the way they have. And so I'm just sort of wondering, um, do, do you see any kind of path by which the stories of individuals um, can affect those? apparently, you know, seemingly intractable problems, those big systems, um, how, do, how does it connect? Yeah, um, I think that there's solutions that come out of small specific circumstances um, that the way I see it, those things might, it, it might be easy to cast things off and see, say like, oh, just one person acting in their own community individually, how could that possibly have an impact? And like, perhaps, you know, yes, that is a defeatist way of looking at it. Um, there's, there's this one woman that I can, I'll just describe the section rather than reading from it directly, but there's a woman I met in New Zealand, her name is Tanea Tangaroa, and she's Maori, and, um, decided to spend several decades of her life restoring a wetland that had been used as a landfill site. And that landfill was unlined, and so there's all sorts of toxins that are leaching from it into the surrounding community. And yet, the work that she's done doing really like physical things, like hauling out tires and reintroducing native plants, um, has not only led to a re-flourishing of the plant life, but also all of these native animals are returning as well. And uh, while it's not possible to do things like harvest traditional medicine sources from that um, wetland, what she has done is created it, made it into kind of a ecological education site. So the kids who are out of school nearby will come and she will teach them the names of the plants and the animals. And it seems like such a small thing, but I was really struck by 
the ripples I think that of her work are wider than she will ever know right because there were kids who are now being more connected to the landscape than they might have been otherwise and I think that that could be huge <laughs> right um and it's it's a small thing that's a massive thing at the same time so um you know while I think it's important to keep in mind the global scale of the problem the global scale of potential impacts and to do things like specifically target fossil fuel infrastructure which we know will have an outsized impact compared to anything else there's a great small short book written by i, I want to say a person from scandinavia called how to blow up a pipeline that if you're curious thank you it's a great book by andreas mom i would highly recommend it um but i think it helps put some of this, this work into context too. Because I think taking on the magnitude of the climate crisis as an individual and thinking that I have to solve this all by myself is a fast track towards um, feeling really burnt out, <laughs> a lot of despair. But to the extent that we can um, you know, join up with like-minded people or you know, learn about folks like Tanea who are using their personal passions and expertise to really make a difference in their communities, I think that that's what I see is the best way forward. Yeah. 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 Wait, what? Mike. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah. Um, so now that the book has been written and you've collected a thousand and one stories, is there any way that you um, envision yourself expanding the project, um, collecting more stories, and what would what would that look like? What are your next steps? Sure. Yeah. So I'm kind of taking a break from actively recording stories right now because it was a very all encompassing part of my life for about five years and I loved it. And I'm kind of in a different season right now. Um, doing this project uh, sort of made me fall sideways into journalism, which is not what I expected when I got started. Um, but I now work as an opinion editor at The Inquirer, which I love. And I get to work on all sorts of issues, but sometimes climate too. And what brings me a lot of joy in that work is um, helping people express their personal experiences and arguments that have come out of those experiences in a way that's maximally effective to an audience. And so in a way, there's a, a through line that's very direct from point A to point B. Um, and what drives me and what gets me out of bed in the morning is the chance to maybe have an impact, however small. Uh, I always tell my writers, you know, in the thank you email at the end of the op-ed, like, here's the link, please let me know if there's an impact that comes from this, right? Because I might not know what happens, but maybe it's a small policy change, or, you know, maybe they get people writing to them saying that they'd never thought about this issue in exactly that way, and that's a way of, like, measuring how uh, change happens, I guess. <laughs> but, um, in terms of the, the stories themselves, so I have this kind of audio archive of material from the project um, that uh, <laughs> would I would love to um, have available for researchers in the future, in part because as an undergrad, I had some very transformative experiences at the archives in Harvard, like being elbow deep in um, Anne Sexton's typewritten first drafts of her poems that were crossed out with little pencil bits and I'm like oh my god Anne Sexton has shitty first drafts mm -hmm. like this <laughs> it was so satisfying <laughs> um, to see how many times she went through um and I also made wonderful friends with a person who was still alive um in Vermont at the time named Cora Brooks who had donated her papers to the Schlesinger Library and the History of Women in America so I don't I, you know this hasn't happened yet but I hope that that audio can be a part of an archive in the future because I would love for some future person to know how during this five year period of time from you know 2013 14 to 2018 ish people were talking about climate change in all these different parts of the world maybe it might be of use yeah. go for it hi um I'm wondering why climate change is reported on in such aloof terms and why we haven't seen stories like these more widely reported for the last couple hundred years. When you say reported, do you mean like news, the way science is communicated or yeah, what, kinda what like you think of? Yeah, kind of like what you were saying with like de uh, describing it in levels of like uh, rising sea levels or temperature change. Yeah, um, 
think a couple of things. I think that there was a very concerted effort by people who had vested interests in the fossil fuel industry and other connected establishments to try to like debunk or discredit the science. I think that science communication is in many ways kind of a nascent field. Uh, and that's part of why I studied science journalism in grad school because I realized on this trip there's this huge gap between the ways that people are discussing scientific issues, including climate change, and the ways that the general public understands them. And bridging that gap is an act of translation. And so what I got to practice in that program was asking better questions of scientists, which is sort of what I started to do in, in the research for the book, but really honed in on. And so it's <laughs> doing things like, you know, how a asking someone who's a specialist in their field, it doesn't have to be just science too. I think everyone is like kind of cocooned in the jargon of their discipline. And jargon is important. It's a shorthand that we can use to speak to each other if we know that we have the same jargon. But if we don't have the same jargon, then it's like we're speaking different languages. So if I'm interviewing a scientist, I say, okay, imagine I'm eight years old. How would you explain this topic to me? <laughs> and um, grocery store metaphors are fun, right? So if we're talking about the size of something, I'm like, well, how would you explain this to me in terms of the size of something you might find at a grocery store? And then those metaphors um, become... I mean, so when I'm, when I'm editing op-eds, right, I think about the big idea as this bunch of balloons. And then if you just have a big idea that's a bunch of balloons, it's going to float away and no one's going to be able to hold on to it. <laughs> so you need little paperweights to hold down your big idea. And those paperweights are um, storytelling, good storytelling. And what's good storytelling? It's uh, tactile details. It's explaining things clearly and succinctly. It's comparing something to something you might find at a grocery store. It's using good action verbs and like pressuring every verb and every sentence, right? Things that you can learn from reading and studying poetry. So that for me as a word nerd brought me a ton of joy because I could solve what I thought was a, like a need that I saw with my obsession with language. <laughs> yeah. First of all, thank you so much for this. Thanks um, for coming. Yeah. And second of all, um, I was really interested about um, when you mentioned that climate change was a women's issue specifically. Mm -hmm. I have heard slash read uh, a lot about um, it's how it's a socioeconomic issue, um, of course, especially for those in the global south. But I have not uh, read about how it affects uh, women in particular. Could yeah. you talk some more about that? Yeah, sure. So a couple of things. I mean, the story with Angie is a pretty clear distillation of that because she's the one who in her family is in charge of allocating the water. And so it becomes this thing that she's always thinking about, an extra source of stress in her life. And it's not just for her. It's multiplied by every woman in that community, right? Um, second thing is that there's, um, yeah, I wish I could remember the names of these researchers offhand, but there's been a couple of, of really compelling papers drawing a direct line between the aftermath of intense weather events and increasing instances of domestic violence against women. So it's kind of increasing, um, it's a, a threat magnifier, right? <laughs> the problems that already exist in the community are going to become more intense in the aftermath of things that are connected with climate. So that's the way I see it. But, um, yeah, I think it's uh, probably something that's under discussed. And so thanks for pointing that out. I'll try to make it clear in the future. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. I feel very happy that you've been doing this work. So um, my question is about the homogenization of stories. So we all know like Greta Thunberg's story blew up everywhere. Um, and one time I was at a conference with a lot of activists from all over the world. And somebody asked, who here has, as an activist, been called the Greta Thunberg of their country? And everybody raised their hand. Even an activist from Sweden, she was called the Greta Thunberg from Sweden. <laughs> like, it was just absolutely insane. Um, and I've been occupying that space a lot of trying to deconstruct the homogenization of a story and seeing like only this one person can be an activist because they had this experience or they had this um, action that they took and it went viral or whatever. So I think um, my question is, how do you combat that? How do you make sure that people know that they have their own story to share? 
Um, and how do, especially in the media, how do we keep, you know, this from happening where people are described only by what they resemble rather than who they are? Mm. Yeah, thanks for asking that question. Um, I think it's interesting. I got started before Greta was, you know, greta um, <laughs> but um, I did get compared to this guy, Andrew Forstoffel, who walked the width of the United States collecting stories from people he wrote or he met along the way. And um, he ended up writing a book. But first he had a, a segment on this American life that was really well received. And people were like, oh, you're the girl, Andrew Forstoffel on a bike, climate change. I'm like, <laughs> I read his book and I'm like, mm -hmm kind of not really um and I think that it's it's sort of a you know a fault of the way that we can think sometimes like we want to neatly categorize people in our minds in terms of like okay you are like this or not like that and and what you're mentioning is that we have to you know recognize people's individuality and complicate those <laughs> ideas a little bit right um, and, you know, I, I say this in the same breath as being really grateful for Greta's work and, like, frankly, the um, power of her PR team, which I think is very powerful, um, <laughs> which is why we all know about her, right? Um, because she really has forced this, this issue to be more widely discussed, especially at high levels of government, et cetera, right? And so that's, that's huge. Um, but, you know, she shouldn't be sucking up all the oxygen in the room and people should be recognized for their individual efforts as well. And, and I think that that just comes down to, you know, talking from the, from the question earlier about what, what can individuals do, right? Or what does an individual actually even matter if we're facing this huge systemic problem? I think that it starts with exactly things like that, with complicating the narrative and with being more mindful about how we discuss these issues. And again, and I keep coming back to the inquirer. Y'all should submit op-eds if you have ideas. But... Um, but uh, it, it becomes hard if we are relying on those same tropes over and over again because people get bored and they tune out and they see climate in a the headline they're like thank you next so I think that we can do it's 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 important beyond even just recognizing those individual people but in just making sure that we're bringing more readers more listeners into the fold and that's a hard task it's an unending task because there will always be the polar bear in the room, right? There was one point, I don't know if this is still the case, but where polar bears were the symbol for climate change, right? And it's like, ah, what about humans, right? Um, we can't just have one image of one polar bear on one floating iceberg and then say, okay, that's climate. I understand it now. Um, so it, it just all gets back to better communication, diversifying communication, having different voices talking on this subject like I don't I don't want it to be just me I don't want it to be just any one person right um but that's how I think through it but I'm really glad you're thinking about that too it's so important yeah, yeah in the back thanks. we'll um, get you a mic though yeah thanks um so firstly insane stuff um that was a really really enlightening talk thank you um thanks. for doing this for us today Something that I've realized is that my climate story, I guess, or my climate problems when I used to live back in India were much different, much more severe compared to the problems that I face in terms of climate change now that I come to university in the US. So how, since you do journalism, and I'm, of course you're listening to these insane stories from people from all walks of life all across the world, all different geographic locations, how do you sort of tread that path between bringing out the severity of the problems, because everyone's climate story is gonna be the most severe problem to them. Mm. But at the same time, how do you address the climate privilege that some people may have even within the problems that they've faced versus problems that people have faced who come from underserved communities or who come from regions where climate is not an issue, where their voices are not even heard. Uh, where they're doing, they don't even have a platform to talk about why climate change is affecting them. Yeah. I mean, it's fun. I'm like drawing, I feel like I'm drawing a web between everyone's questions because they're all interrelated. It's like we need to have a better understanding of how women in the global south are facing these issues directly. Um, and, but, but the question of how to do that, I mean, I think it, it, you mentioned about recognizing privilege, and I think that that is just so essential and I think about this all the time it's like I'm I'm 
blind to the things that I don't even know. And even going on this trip in the first place and having the financial support of an institution to be able to, you know, get a grant to kick me off is a huge privilege. I don't take that, take that lightly, right? And so I tried to like, okay, how can I use this for good and not evil and try to amplify these voices that people aren't hearing that aren't part of the conversation. But in terms of how to do that more broadly and continue to do it, I mean, I think it... It comes down to listening better, but listening in in different ways and trying to get creative about it. And I just want to be like humble and fully admit that I do not have all the solutions. But if you have an idea, <laughs> I bet it's a really good one. Um, and I know that I would be eager to hear it, and I bet many other people would too. So I would encourage you to lean into that because it seems like there's a kernel of an idea there. And if it's something that's passionate, you're passionate about that you feel like gets you out of bed in the morning, then I say go for it because we need it. Yeah, thank you. Um, Debbie, I'm going to ask you to do another short reading in just a second. But um, (laughs) let me ask you a question maybe that will set up that reading, um, which is that um, as we're thinking about the kinds of stories and the diversity of stories and trying to combat the homogeneity of stories, one of the things I love about your book is that you do just that. There are many different, there's a thousand and one <laughs> stories about climate change and and like in a thousand and one nights, they can keep going forever, right? Yeah. There's a seemingly inexhaustible supply. It's, it's I think, an incredible um, idea that you're running with here. Um, but I'm curious not so much about the storytelling, but your process of editing. You spoke so beautifully about your fascination with archives, and you've created an archive yourself of these huge amounts of stories that you have collected. Only some of them, of course, made it into the book. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, what I imagine is the really difficult choices that you made to include the stories that you included, how you edited. Sometimes I know in in the work we do in the My Climate Story project, we have people who think they're talking about climate change, and we're like, well, are you sure that's really a story about climate change? Mm -hmm. And for us, that's a big educational moment, actually, where we then say, like, well, let us talk with you about climate attribution science and things like that. Um, So I'm just sort of curious about the editing process, and then maybe you could pick a story in the book or, or an excerpt to read for us that was maybe either particularly difficult to edit or was a, you felt a more risky inclusion in the book? Sure, yeah, so um, thanks thanks for asking that. I, I love talking shop about editing. So, okay, um, but first I wanna talk about rejection because I think that rejection is a huge part of how this book came to be in the first place. Um, first, if anyone out there is like even thinking about writing a book, you should do it and I want to validate that in you um and also let you know that like the path towards that has got a lot of rejection on the way and that's okay um so this book was not preordained I did not start out this trip with the idea of making a book um I started out the trip with the idea of making an audio archive and I wanted to have a map where you could click on a point listen to a story from that place um and a couple things happened early on uh one is I joined a a Facebook group of women and gender non-binary writers in 2014 when I was getting started on this trip who um, encouraged me to pitch to different journalistic outlets and uh, mentored me through the process of writing a pitch, which is terrifying the first time you do it and not so scary the 30th, Um, and um, landed an essay at The Guardian and then later at The New York Times, and I had agents reaching out to me being like, hey, it sounds like this trip you're doing is a book. We should talk. I'm like, okay, if if you say so. Uh, And so I started working with this lovely guy named Tim. We love Tim. He answers all of my questions. Um, And Tim and I sent out a first round book proposal in 2016 to 40 editors at different publishers and we got back all rejections. And he said, Debbie, do you want to read the rejection emails? Because some people don't want to, it makes them sad. I'm like, yeah, let's go. (laughs) So I printed them all out, tacked them to the wall, like spent about a month trying to figure out what the commonalities were between them. And it was a couple things. So the book I had pitched, I wanted to be talk about like like someone I wanted to be like the the girl studs Turkel of climate change so just edited transcripts of the audio that of stories that people had told me unadulterated their words because who am I to intervene in the magic of their language right um and 
uh, the feedback I got on that was what's going to keep someone turning the pages, right? You pick up this book, you read two climate change stories, you feel depressed, and you put it down. <laughs> and so I realized that there was really no narrative architecture to what I was proposing and no sinew that would keep all of those stories connected. And that the only narrative architecture and sinew that I could possibly put in was myself. And this made me cringe big time because I didn't want to write some kind of personal self-actualization journey using the people I had listened to in these stories as like, you know, ways of getting to my highest self or whatever the heck. But um, so, but I realized I had to do that in order to A, sell the book and B, like have people keep turning the pages. So um, while it made me uncomfortable, I tried to lean into that discomfort and strike a balance where there was just enough of myself that I could explain who I was, why I was doing this, how I met the various people that I connected with, in some cases what I learned from those stories, um, and in some cases a little bit about how I changed, but not really that much, just like really minimum on that and maximum on people's quotes. But the other thing is that the way that people speak doesn't always translate really neatly to the page, but journalistically, I want to use quotes accurately. <laughs> um, and in some cases, there were language barriers, and I was working with translations. Um, but what, what I did, and this was mostly in 2020, so I had this massive spreadsheet of all the audio files. Um, which was uh, the the way the audio recorder I was using um, spit out a number that was the year, the day, the month, and the numberth recording from that day. Um, and then I had a field notebook that was the notes that I had taken, like a person's name, their contact information, if possible, a little bit about what the story was about, but I didn't have anything more than that. Um, used an audio transcribing software to get the gist of what was happening, and then. Uh, I actually remember it a lot once I started listening to it. Audio is kind of an amazingly intimate medium <laughs> in that way where it sort of transported me back to where I was. Um, and yeah, pulled quotes that I thought were interesting. Um, again, for the book writers out there, I would highly recommend a software called Scrivener, um, which is kind of like a digital note card. It's pretty cheap too. I think it's like in the $50 range um, and you don't have to be online to do it. But if you write a whole book in a Word doc or a Google doc, um, you'll have to scroll for about 50 years <laughs> until you get from the top to the bottom. So Scrivener's great because you can take these note cards and like shuffle them around and only work on one section at a time so it doesn't feel as overwhelming as opening up the whole thing and like questioning existential, yeah, it's just a lot. Um, so, so yeah, I was diving into these note cards, um, pulling the edited transcripts, and then figuring out how much of myself to sprinkle in there to keep people going without feeling weird. Um, <laughs> but now I'm like, which part do I read <laughs> that's connected to all of those things? Um, I mean, maybe I could pull you guys, because there's, there's any number of sections I could pull, but do we want to go to Oceania, <laughs> Asia, Central Asia, the US, Peru, Sweden, or Norway? Like, somebody please shout something. I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> Let's go to Scandinavia. Scandinavia. OK, uh, Denmark, Sweden, or Norway. <laughs> <laughs> Norway. Norway, okay. Uh, let me see what page that actually starts on. Give me a minute. Talk amongst yourselves. 284. Oh, I feel like Snape. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. This is the first part of the Norway chapter. Already north of the Arctic Circle, I caught a bus to Tromso following the places where scientists gather. Tromsø is often the last stop that researchers make before crossing the Arctic Ocean to Svalbard, the northernmost year-round settlement in the world, and home to researchers of many nationalities. Ger Wing Gabrielsen, a senior research scientist in environmental pollutants at the Norwegian Polar Institute, sat down with me in his office for an interview. Stacks of papers and books crowded most of the available desk space, and a wide window overlooked the water. Gare has been researching Arctic animals for nearly four decades. In recent years, his focus has turned to plastic pollution. In 1987, he started investigating the diet of the fulmar, a bird that can live up to 60 years in the wild. Of the 40 birds he sliced open, four had plastic in their stomach. Fulmars are surface feeders, so they likely think the plastic is plankton. <laughs> <laughs> 
In 2013, he repeated the study with dramatically different results. Some birds had more than 200 pieces of plastic in their stomachs, preventing the uptake of nutrients. In Europe, fulmars has been found on the beaches, starved to death because of the overload of plastic in their stomachs. Part of the reason there's so much plastic in the Arctic is that ocean currents are changing. Gare showed me a graph of carbon dioxide measurements taken at the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, one of the longest CO2 time series in the world, starting in 1958. While there is an annual cyclicality between a northern hemisphere summer and winter, lower in the summer when carbon dioxide is absorbed by the sea, the measurements show that the amount of CO2 has been steadily increasing since the time series began, surpassing 400 parts per million in 2013. And an increased concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide, nitrogen oxide, aerosols, and methane, is making the oceans warmer, which changes their currents. This, in turn, pushes more plastic contamination into the Arctic. Plastic production is itself a fossil fuel intensive process. Two kilograms of oil are used to produce one kilogram of plastic. Plastic is now found not only in Arctic surface waters, but also on the bottom of the ocean floor and in sea ice. Gare, in his work with seabirds, has witnessed other changes in the ecosystem. Fjords that used to be dominated by polar species now have Atlantic species. And species that used to be farther south, like capelin, herring, mackerel, and Atlantic cod, are more prominent than polar cod. The ambient temperature of the fjord in the summer has increased by 3 to 4 degrees Celsius. And in the winter, seawater is 1 to 2 degrees higher than the old average. These physical changes eventually translate into biological changes. Atlantic water contains higher levels of contaminants than Arctic water. Svalbard used to be surrounded by polar water. Now, Atlantic water dominates, which means more persistent organic pollutants plus mercury. These substances are transported by the current, but also by the animals themselves. They are stored in body fat, which impacts their immune and endocrine systems. When the Atlantic system drifts northward, pollution more readily enters the food chain. Fish eat plankton, the seal eats the fish, the polar bear eats the seal and the toxicity accumulates in the body of the apex predator at the top of the food chain. Changes in atmospheric and sea currents are accelerating the transportation of contaminants throughout the system. Gare pointed to the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, a swirling mass of plastic more than three times the size of France, located between North America and Asia. It's telling us we need to do something to prevent what's going on with regard to plastic pollution, he said. There are an estimated 100,000 marine ant mammals and turtles, and one million seabirds killed by plastic pollution each year. We all agree to take care of our coastline, but nobody wants to take care of what's going on far away from us, out at sea, Gare said. Um, so kind of speaking, if I can like put on my writing teacher hat for a second. <laughs> um, when I was doing these interviews, right, he, he was passing on like a, a massive amount of information in his own words. But one thing, when, when I'm editing op-eds too, it's the same thing. If someone's done an interview, you don't want it to just all be one massive quote because oftentimes the way that they say it, you can maybe explain it slightly more clearly as a writer as long as you've absorbed the facts from the interview and are fact-checking <laughs> as well, um, and sprinkle in some other stuff, like you know, comparing the Pacific garbage patch to the size of France, things like that. But um, I tried to be sparing, and, and to an extent, this is something I really learned from writing this book, too, and rereading it, um, but trying to be sparing with the quotes makes them maximally effective. So in your writing, I would encourage you all <laughs> to do that. I really use a quote when someone's explaining something in a way that you could not say better yourself, but if you're, you can kind of gloss it explain it on your own, but yeah, that's, that's Gare. He's a great guy. <laughs> yeah, go for it. Oh, yeah, get the mic. Yeah. Yeah, great, great. So you, you talked about the pitch that got rejected uh -huh. and 30 times or, or whatever it was. 40. 40 yeah. times, right, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what did the pitch that finally was successful, what, what did it emphasize? So it, it came about in a bit of an unconventional way. So I, I was at MIT doing this science journalism program. Um, a friend of mine saw that the career office was putting on an event by uh, an alum from our sister program in comparative media studies, um, this guy, um, Sam Ford, who at the time had just started working for Simon & Schuster um, for one of their um, presses called Tiller Press. Um, and we went and it was, there were only three of us in the room, so we had a very extended um, introduction. And he was he was zooming in, I think, from either Kentucky or New York. Um, 
but I explained a little bit about the project because he was genuinely curious, you know, why we were there and what we were passionate about. And he's like, oh, that sounds like a book. We should talk. <laughs> so when I hear someone say that, I'm like, yes, we should. <laughs> so I chatted with him. I'm like, I have this book proposal that was rejected a bunch of times, but I think I know how I want to change it. He's like, okay, send it along. So I did that, and, and his team said yes. Um, and then I was like, oh, no, I have to write it, <laughs> which is a totally different. Pitching for fiction and nonfiction books is very different. So nonfiction, they generally want to see um, a sample chapter, and then you do, like, comparative analysis where you're comparing your book to books that already exist like comp titles and you know an intro to who you are and your social media following all that stuff right um fiction you have to have the whole thing done so I I changed the intro chapter quite a bit to the way that I wanted to write the book and and they they said yes it was like September 2019 and we started that conversation in yeah I don't know April or May of that year um and the deadline got pushed back a little bit because of the pandemic, which I was very grateful for. So <laughs> I guess this is all to say it's a very long process. But um, I'll, I'll say one more thing about book writing because I, I bet there's a lot of writers in the crowd. Um, when I started working on the draft, I had a, a full-time job as a fellow at the New York Times opinion section. And there's this really wonderful um, editor who was there at the time, Clay Risen. He writes obituaries now. Um, and he moonlights as a whiskey writer and also writes books about like FDR at night. And he's a dad. And I'm like, Clay, how do you do all this? <laughs> and he said, oh, it's easy. You know, you, you work on it for an hour or two a night, six nights a week. And at the end of a couple months, you have something that's long enough to be a book and, and you have to take a day off each week. That's really important. I'm like, okay. Um, and that advice was very, very helpful to me. So I'm passing on in hopes that it might be helpful to you too. But you don't have to sit down and think I'm going to write all day today because that's physically impossible. But if you, you know, put on the tomato timer and do it in little tiny sprints for a certain number of hours, for a certain number of days, over a certain number of months, you will get there. I believe in you. Yeah. <laughs> One more. Yeah. 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 From the YouTube. Oh, cool. Hi. Yeah. Um, okay. So Hello, this internet. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this person said they would love to hear more about how your study of poetry contributed to how you wrote this book and represented the people and places that you encountered. Oh, yeah. Oh, I love poetry. Um, so I took some really incredible poetry classes as an undergrad where we were to memorize some stuff but we were also you know reading really widely but also reading each other's work and um unpacking what works and what doesn't work and um even in high school I had this had this one per, or one teacher Becky Moore who had us diagram poems so she'd um you know we'd read a poem and then she'd separate like on the chalk bar draw out and write all the different parts of speech so you'd have like a column of nouns and a column of verbs and the, the other ones <laughs> and um what what I feel like I really learned from that and and just from reading really widely and trying to unpack what I liked and why I like it and of course personal taste is you know lovely and everyone should like different things and like what they like but the poets I love and the poems I really love um often have incredible verbs um I think verbs are the engine of the sentence, right? And and so to the extent that we can use better verbs, we can have more active writing that's specific and great. Um, and then I liked poems that picked me up somewhere and left me off somewhere different than when I started. And I like poems that uh, change the way I breathe in some way, <laughs> which sounds hokey, but like if I've read something really good, like my breath does change. <laughs> I can pay attention to the feeling of that in my body. And so I don't think I have necessarily achieved that goal here, but I, I also, um, the way that I wrote it, you know, I mentioned the little note cards earlier in Scrivener, but I actually ended up, um, creating sections, um, to have like little tiny sections within each country or each geographic area, in part because I can be an easily distracted reader. I like poems because they're short, <laughs> right? But little chunks of prose were easier to digest than big massive ones, so I don't have to be flipping to see how many more pages there are to go. Um, but also, um, I read this really incredible work of fiction when I was writing. I think reading and writing are so deeply intertwined, and like ideally you can be doing both at the same time, which isn't always possible. But um, this great book by Valeria Louise Sally is called Lost Children Archive. I would highly recommend it. Um, it's about a family that uh, starts in New York City and ends in the desert southwest. And um, I don't want to spoil it any more than that, but it's organized into different archival boxes. And then there's like 
little tiny sections within that and I was reading it and getting so much joy from that format that I'm like oh I would like to be like Valeria (laughs) so (laughs) can I steal that format and apply it to something completely different so um that's sort of how I think through it but thanks for the question internet Lost Children Archive by Valeria Luiselli. She's an incredible writer. Yeah. Um, I just want to say thank you to you, thank Debbie. You so much. Before we applaud you, um, I really do encourage you, especially if you are interested in poetic language and storytelling. Um, Debbie tomorrow will be offering an interactive component of the program where she will be coaching um, on being a uh, active listeners, deep listeners. And um, she has here, I'm holding in my hand this one page worksheet that she made um, that we'll be passing out to everyone tomorrow um, to get you to not only share your climate story, but learn how to deep listen to others' climate stories and then be inspired by poets, including my own favorite, Craig Santos Perez, but also Joy Harjo, Kathy Jedniel Kitchener, and others um, to really then take those stories that you tell or that you hear, um, put them in dialogue with poetic techniques and really come up with an amazing story. So we hope to see you tomorrow, 10 a.m. at Irvine Auditorium. And please, please join me in thanking Debbie for this great talk. Thank you all. Thank you so much. And please stay for the reception. There's lots more conversation to be had and snacks, of course, too.